Playing around with old computers is fun. It's the whole basis for this entire channel. But one of the problems with working with these old relics is that rarely is anything a straightforward process. And one of the most annoying hurdles is how do I get files from this to something like this, like this. Red claws. All retro PCs are a little bit different and sometimes require different methods to get files on them. But in this video, I'm gonna show you the options you have at your disposal and the best ways that I've found to make life a little bit more convenient when working on these old machines. Now, some people might argue that the inconvenience is part of the fun of working on old computers. And I agree to a certain extent, but sometimes I wanna get a YouTube video out you know, more than twice a year and uh, taking some shortcuts helps you out. But sometimes the old slow methods are good and that brings us to our first option, which is floppy disks. Using floppies on older computers like the Apple IIe or the C64 is perfectly acceptable most of the time because of how simple the programs are. However, on 90s PCs, it's a different story. While floppies were still used widely, they became much less convenient due to how large programs were getting. Case in point, Microsoft's last OS that was possible to install on a floppy was Windows 95, which came on 13 disks. Suffice to say, this is probably the least convenient way to install Windows 95. Despite being antiquated, the 3.5 inch floppy disk is still an option in 2025 for moving small files or drivers. I use these sometimes when it makes sense, and there's still something fun and novel about using them. One advantage of this format is USB floppy drives that work on any OS are cheap and plentiful, and just work for the most part. It does seem like sometimes the disks either work forever or they die on a trip across the room though, so they're still a pain in the butt at times. Like the floppy, CD-ROMs are another thing that many 90s PCs have. CDRs are cheap and much faster than floppies, but burning them is still a bit of a slow ordeal, and if you forget to put something on them, you need to burn a whole new disk. Just using them to move files also seems wasteful sometimes, since they're basically disposable. You could use CDRWs, which can be rewritten and reused, but they're super slow when it comes to erasing them. CDs have their place, like the aforementioned floppy disk, especially when it comes to old restore media but I really only like to use either of those if there's no other options available. Makes you wonder though, what if we had a storage medium like a floppy disk, but more in line with the capacity of a CD? Well, we do. Enter the zip disk. Or don't, actually. The idea of the zip disk sounds good on paper, with capacities on the later disks up to 750 megabytes, but it's flawed too much for me to recommend using it all. Not only are their drives and disks notoriously unreliable, you really need two of them to make moving files worthwhile. Theoretically, you could just use an external drive and move it from computer to computer, but they're slow compared to the internal ones and require a big AC adapter, as well as a resource hungry driver if you're running them under DOS. I think the zip disk is fun to use and that motorized eject is really cool, but it doesn't end up being a great solution for much these days. The same thing applies to other less popular super floppy type drives, or even that Sony floppy memory stick adapter I covered. They're just too expensive or troublesome to use for anything other than just experiencing them for what they are. What about Serial? No, no, not that Serial, this one. Software like Laplink and FastLinks can be used to transfer files over a Serial connection. It isn't extremely fast, as Serial usually isn't. However, you can use the special Laplink cable, which gives you speed slightly faster than regular Serial. But this method is best reserved when you don't have many other options besides a floppy. Since Serial is easy enough to get on modern machines with adapters, you can also send from a modern machine directly using DOSBox or a compatible modern Windows app. I've not used this much myself, if I'm being honest. But if you want to see how it works, I would recommend this Retro Tech Chris video to see it in action. What about more cereal? No, no not that cereal. USB, Universal Serial Bus. These flash drive thingies have been around for years now and are probably the most versatile type of removable storage ever conceived. 
They actually work with older systems that include USB ports, with some caveats. NT systems like Windows 2000 and XP work without drivers just like they would on modern Windows. Out of the box, Windows 98 SE doesn't support USB flash drives, but unofficial mass storage drivers can be used, and they work great for the most part. Most of the time you are limited to USB 1.1 speeds, but you can get USB 2.0 PCI cards that work with 98 if you look around. Unfortunately, if you want to use older versions of Windows like 3.1, 95, or DOS, USB is not a viable option. There is a mass storage driver floating around for Windows 95 OSR 2.1 which supports USB, but I've never been able to get it to work properly with the hardware I have. Overall, USB is obviously a great option if it is available. I also like to use it to replace CDs if I'm on Windows 98. I just load all of my images on a USB drive and then mount it using Virtual Clone Drive 5.4. And this is what I use this for most of the time. I don't have to burn CDs, and I don't have to worry about filling the hard drive up with images. Now, all the options I've described in this video have their niche uses and times when they just make sense to use. But by far the most universal solution that I found for transferring files quickly and easily is by replacing your hard drive with a CF or compact flash card. While CF cards are usually reserved for cameras, they work well in old PCs since they use the same parallel ATA interface as normal IDE hard drives. Just make sure you stick to the low capacity cards as the modern ones are different. You do need to install an adapter to make this work, but they're as cheap as six or seven dollars on eBay. They also come in mobile and desktop varieties, so you can install them in pretty much any device. For desktop use, I do like this more expensive StarTech model that you can mount to a 3.5 inch bay. This makes swapping the cards out super fast, but I've found the other models, including the one that mounts to the back with a PCI slot, works just as well, so it's really just up to personal preference. Once they're installed, you can use them like any other drive on the system, and install your OS, games, etc. If you want to transfer files to the old machine, all you need to do is power off, eject the card, and use a USB card reader to transfer files on any modern computer. When you pop it back in the old computer, it will boot up with all your files right where you put them. Piece of cake. By far the best thing about this method is how easy it makes it to switch to different operating systems on the same machine. Since the 4 gig cards I use only cost around $5 a piece and are easily removable, you can quickly swap operating systems just by popping in a different card. This also makes backing up images and restoring computers to their default state super easy. I like to use the free version of Macrium Reflect to make backup images of all the OS configurations for my PCs. Any cloning tool can work for this though, so Clonezilla is fine if you're living that FOSS life. I just like Macrium for its speed, and it doesn't require you to load into a boot environment. Whatever cloning tool you use, backups come in super handy if you're like me and you're testing things all the time. Windows 95, especially, likes to just straight up nuke itself seemingly at random, and doing a complete reinstall along with reloading drivers every time this happens is a pain in the hole. With this, all I need to do is pop a CF card in my USB reader, do a restore operation, and I have a fresh Windows install ready in like two minutes. Now, if you are replacing your hard drive with a CF card in a mobile device, such as a laptop or a tablet, obviously you're not going to be able to swap cards out easily without taking the device apart. There is a solution to this though, if you still wanna swap files back and forth using CF cards. So you can install these Cardbus CF card adapters and you can't boot off of them, but as long as you have the drivers installed for your Cardbus, they'll just show up like any other hard drive on the system. There aren't really any downsides to using CF cards, except that you don't get the hard drive sounds anymore if you're into that. And even then you can just install the CF card as a secondary drive and use your hard drive for the OS. Just make sure if you're investing in these to grab some Molex to floppy power adapters since most power supplies only have one and that's how these adapters are powered. I'll link all the hardware and software I referenced below for you to check out 
but I really do find this to be the most cheap and convenient way to move files. And for me, it's my end game solution for all my retro machines. However, I'd love to see what you guys do or if there's any better solutions. So start a discussion below, but that's gonna wrap this video up for today. Thank you very much for watching and subscribing if you did that. As always, special thanks to my members and patrons who keep the channel and my motivation to make videos alive. And on that note, I'll see you all in the next video.